Good morning, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. This is episode 29, and we're joined by a very special guest. His name is Brian Tui, and he is an author of several books. We're going to talk about one in particular today called The Fix is Still In, and it talks about the world of sports and um, the elaborate, I guess, schemes that go into the sports entertainment world today. Um, he's been an author of several books before, Larceny Games as well, The Fix is In, The Showbiz, Manipulations of the NFL, NL, MLB, NBA, NHL, and NASCAR, A Season in the, in the Abyss, a lot of different um, books that he's published. Welcome to the show, and thanks for accepting the invitation. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yes, I want the audience to kind of get um, an idea of how did you get into this line of work? And um, and just when was like the first time that you thought that this, there was a disconnect between what you were watching on television and sports as far as um, is this just entertainment or are these athletes actually putting on a show for us? Where did that start? I think it was a combination of two things. One is, I think, just from watching sports. You know, if you're a longtime sports fan, you've seen enough things whether it's in the NFL or the NBA or whatever, where you're just like, wow, it's amazing how well that worked out for everyone, isn't it? You know, so many like coincidences that just don't seem to add up. And it always seems like when the ball bounces one way, it always seemed to bounce in a certain player's way or a certain team's way or a certain, the league's way in a sense. And then just from reading, I always read and I read a lot of sports books because I did grow up a sports fan. There was two books in particular one was they call it a game by Bernie Parrish, who was a former NFL player. And I mean, the book's old, it's from like 1971. But in it, he basically wrote that he felt like when the CBS and the other television networks invested in the NFL, he felt like they basically bought the NFL and that the game really changed on a dime as soon as that television money came in and it suddenly became more of a television show than a sport. And he even alleged in his book way back then that he thought Super Bowl three had been fixed. Um, to facilitate the merger between the AFL and NFL. He thought it was all just a big business deal and that that game was set up to basically make the merger make sense into fans' minds. And then on top of that, I read another book by a guy named Dan Moldea, who I actually talked to a few times. And he wrote this book called Interference, How Organ I think it was called How Organized Crime Influences the NFL. And in his book, he researched and found that probably as many as 75 to 80 NFL games had been fixed over the years by gamblers and organized crime. And that's something that the NFL to this day says has never happened once. And so when I put that idea of the television buying into the league and perhaps changing it from being a sport into being entertainment, and then this idea of games being readily fixed by gamblers and organized crime, I just kind of merged the two together, did some research, and here I am. It took me a while as a viewer, like I follow sports, I play sports, but it took me a while to um, get around the concept of reality TV and sports, like the intersection of those two, because I've always kind of understood like most things on TV, including the news, like it's there for ratings, like there has to be a revenue stream. And so, but it never really got into my mind, okay, sports aren't like that, of course, because these people are so athletic and they're so skilled and stuff. It would be impossible for someone to do something like that. But the more and more I saw the gambling sponsorships popping up, yeah, it kind of, that kind of scared me as a viewer. And you could kind of just see the promotion, the fantasy sports was pushed heavily, I think in the 2000s. And then all of a sudden the fan duels and the DraftKings they have partnerships with the leagues now. And I think that was kind of like my final straw when I realized that something wasn't right. Yeah. Um, and I had a question about the mafia ties. Do you think that, that there's still a relationship between those two? Like where it's directly influenced by the mafia into our sports leagues now? Well, it's hard to say because the mafia has done a really good job of kind of disappearing. You know, after probably like the 19, probably like the John Gotti era, which was probably what, the 1980s or something, it seemed like all of a sudden organized crime just vanished off the face of the earth. But I'm sure it hasn't. You know, I'm sure there's organized crime everywhere. And so it's interesting because you don't, it's not in your face as was like 60s, 70s, 80s. And so it's hard to say. But I mean, if you go back, historically speaking, with the NFL, 
I mean, the founding of the league was, it was basically run by, you know, gamblers and bookmakers and that sort of thing. Those were the original owners. And like the Mara family, which has been tied with the Giants since day one, I mean, the founder was a bookmaker. That's how he had the money to buy the Giants franchise and the team's still owned by them today. You know, the Rooney family and the Steelers, they were still, he was a heavy horseman. He bet on horse races all the time and that's how he knew Mara from bookmaking and that's how he got into the league. So, I mean, you know, there is that thread, the Bidwells, too, who own the Cardinals. You know, they were tied to uh, Al Capone in the, in the Chicago because they were originally Chicago Cardinals. And so, you know, even though that's, you could say, okay, well, that was 100 years ago, but that's still kind of that thread, I think, still ties into the NFL today. And, you know, again, despite the fact that gambling has become legalized in so many states, in a lot of states, it's still not legal and it's still controlled by organized crime. And there's a lot of people who want to bet and bet legally but they want to be a big, you know, a big player, a whale, if you will. Mm. And they can't bet through these corporate bookmakers because they won't take their bets. So I still think they go to organized crime and bet illegally. So, I mean, to think that, you know, organized crime is out of football or out of sports gambling is, I think, ludicrous. What is the tie between the current sports books, such as the fan duels and the DraftKings and the Bet Rivers and stuff? What are the ties between those companies and organized crime? Is there a link there? Because I've watched videos and mafiosos who are documented mafiosos have made the claims that pretty much all the sports books came from the mafia families at some point. What, what do you believe as far as that's concerned? Well, I don't know. I really, honestly, I haven't looked into potential ties between today's corporate sports books and those organized crime. But I mean, you, again, you go back to the 1960s and 70s, you know, when the mafia controlled Las Vegas and they obviously control the sports books as well. And then, you know, again, maybe organized crime legitimized and became corporate. So it didn't look like organized crime, but you know, those corporate sports books are run like, you know, heavy duty businesses. And that's why they do have, they limit winning players and they get rid of winning players and they willingly accept losing players bets and so, I mean, it's it's kind of organized crime in a different way. <laughs> I mean, if you want to look at that in that sense. But, I mean, what is it really the mafia that's running it? I, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. But it is, you know, a kind of shady business still, if you ask me. Okay. Where are you from originally? Well, I was born and raised outside of Chicago. Outside Chicago. Okay. And reading your book, The, the Fix is Still In, I was astonished. Did I read this right when it was talking about the NCAA, the, the corpus itself that is over the collegiate athletics? And it says that 90% of that revenue comes from the college basketball tournament. Is that true? Yeah, the NCAA, it's split. Um, I forget when, a ways back. And the college football is actually more of a um, conference thing. It's more controlled by the conferences, and that's how they get all their money. But the NCAA as an organization now gets, like you say, it's like 90% of the revenue comes directly from the March Madness from college basketball. And that's why they've clinged to it so hard um, and push it so much is because that's where they get all their money. And really, if it went away, if the NCAA basketball thing went the way the football thing did, I mean, college sports would be decimated because you couldn't have the track and field programs, the baseball programs. I mean, all that would kind of almost vanish because they wouldn't have the money to run them. When, okay, so, and I think the contract right now with Marge Madness extends until 2024. I think there's a 14 year contract. Mm -hmm. And how was that organization able to beat ESPN out with that? Because I was surprised that ESPN did not get that um, contract. Oh, the television contract, you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I think it's it's money. <laughs> it's essentially, they just, whoever, CBS, I'm sure, just outbid them for it. Because, yeah, you think ESPN would be desperate for it. But I think it just all boiled down to money. But again, too, you know, there's always, it's not always just money. I think there are ties between certain individuals and certain, you know, networks and that sort of thing that uh, allow some of these deals to take place. Because, I mean, like with the NFL um, Robert Kraft, who's the owner of the Patriots, he has really close ties to uh, Les Boonvies, who's the uh, basically one of the CEOs of CBS. And so, you know, I think that facilitates the television network uh, contract with the NFL and especially with the AFC. Okay, so when you talk to people just 
everyday people, how many people are watching sports because they think is they're really into it and they have a team that they support and they really believe that the results on the field are organic results and not something else, as opposed to people who are completely skeptical about the sports events in the first place. Do you see more people becoming skeptical towards um, the sporting events or are people just still sort of in their own world, escapist world, and this is real to them? Well, I think if you talk to people, it's really hard to just suddenly go up to them and say, hey, you know, I think that game was fixed. <laughs> it's, not, it's not something that people just like, you know, jump on like that. Um, it's really interesting, though, that, you know, all the email I get from people are all I've are all supportive, are all like, oh, my God, thank you for writing about this and talking about this, because I thought I was the only one type of thing. I rarely ever get an email from somebody who's just a jerk and says you're insane or you're making this up or you're just a conspiracy theorist. A lot of every email I get is very positive and very supportive and very believing in this idea, because I think once you start watching games logically, objectively, and get rid of that fandom, a lot of stuff just jumps right out at you as being like, well, wait, how did that happen? Wait, how come they got the call? How come they were talking about this team and they got all the calls and that team advanced into the playoffs or into the Super Bowl or into the NBA finals? I mean, like I say, there's just I don't believe in coincidences, especially when it's tied to multi-billion dollar businesses. And that's the way I think you have to look at professional sports as is it's a multi-billion dollar business. The NFL gets what, $12 billion a year in revenue. The NBA gets like $8 billion a year in revenue. And you just think they leave it up to chance. Mm -hmm. But what, you know, what business would do that? I mean, if we were talking about, you know, Google or Facebook or Exxon or McDonald's or any other major corporation and you said oh you know they're manipulating people they're controlling things they're trying to make as much money as possible everybody'd be like oh yeah i totally believe you mm -hmm. but when you say well the nfl is doing that then all of a sudden it's like whoa 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 that can't be <laughs> true but i think you're right because it's part of it is that escapism and i mean i don't blame people at all because everybody needs a way to escape i mean whether it's going to the movies or reading comic books or whatever if it's watching football or watching basketball i get it and so when you start attacking that and saying, hey, what you might be watching isn't exactly what you think it is, then you get that pushback. You know, because I many times I've talked to somebody who may be like, whatever, a football fan, and they'll be saying, hey, I think the NBA's been rigging games, and, you know, t games are being tanked, and, you know, they're really pushing LeBron, or they used to be pushing Kobe or Michael Jordan or whatever. And somebody would be like, yeah, you know, I totally believe that. I totally see that. And then I say, well, in the NFL, and they'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, not the NFL. No, the NFL doesn't do that. Uh-uh but that's because they're a fan. And so all of a sudden you're attacking them kind of personally, even though you don't mean to, but it gets to them mm -hmm. right here. And so that changes everything. Yeah. That's what I was getting to that sentiment where people, there is such a, a threshold to where I've talked to people and they say that that may ruin it for me. You know, if that's, you know, fake, you know? Yeah. Well, that's because... what I get told all the time is I ruin sports for people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, good then, you know, Maybe that's a good thing for you. And the WWE comparisons is so interesting because I believe WWE, which they had to change it to entertainment at some point. It used to be World Wrestling Federation. Yep. And now it's World Wrestling Entertainment. And it's based in Connecticut, just like ESPN is. And when I was reading the book, I can't believe, I used to think that ESPN stood for Eastern. <laughs> I, I don't know why. <laughs> because I say Connecticut. East Coast, yeah. East Coast. But I was like, oh, my gosh, it means entertainment. I never knew that that was the first part of the acronym. Yeah. That really threw me off when I was reading. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, so it's basically thrown in your face, this entertainment. Yeah. And you talk about that in the book, how legally sports can be fixed and the events can be fixed. Can you explain that to the audience, how um, these games are allowed to basically be orchestrated whatever way they want to be orchestrated well they're basically there's no law that prevents it and that's the main thing and that's you know people i get a lot of pushback because they're like well just because you say there's no law that prevents it doesn't mean it's happening well again if i could prove that games were legitimately being fixed the way i think they're being fixed we'd be having different conversations <laughs> you know i mean it would just be in your face but basically there's two laws that come close to controlling sports in a way and one's the, called the, basically called the Quiz Show Law, and it dates back to the 1950s when uh, television networks were legitimately fixing um, quiz shows, game shows. 
And they were doing it exactly for the same reasons I think the NFL and the NBA are fixing games is they were fixing them to make them more entertaining. So they're giving certain popular contestants the answers and kind of told them to act like they're struggling to figure it out or whatever, but it was all orchestrated. And so it actually got uncovered by Congress, believe it or not. And they passed a law that said you cannot fix an intellectual contest for television purposes, but it specifically says in the law intellectual contest. So it doesn't mean like survivor can't be fixed or American idol can't be fixed or the bachelor can't be fixed or any of these reality TV shows can't be fixed. It just means you can't fix the show like Jeopardy or Wheel of Fortune. But all these other ones, including the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, the NHL, they can technically be fixed because they're not intellectual contests. And then the other law that exists, which dates back to 1964, is called the Sports Bribery Act. And it's literally four sentences long, and it basically says you cannot bribe a player, a coach, or an athlete to alter the outcome of a game. But if you have other ways of controlling people to get them to alter the outcome of a game, perhaps say like the NBA dictating to its referees how we want you to officiate games, and that may give an advantage to one team or one player over another, and it alters the outcome of a game, well, nobody's being bribed. It's just the employer telling its employee what to do and how to do it, and they go out there and do it, and if it changes the outcome of a game, so be it. So there's no law that's stopping the league from fixing the game. The most closest thing that many people would argue is it'd be fraud. So it'd be fraudulent if they say, we're putting on a legitimate sporting competition, but we're really not. We're kind of messing with it. Well, that's actually been disproven in court because of member or remember back when uh, Spygate happened in the, with the Patriots, mm-hmm. a New York Jets fan sued the New England Patriots in the NFL over it, basically asking for 10 years worth of tickets back because he witnessed so many fixed games essentially conducted by the New England Patriots when they're cheating. And the outcome of that court case, and it went to like the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, the judges basically ruled and they said, look, when you buy a ticket to an NFL game, All the league has to do is put on a football game. It doesn't mean certain rules have to be applied. It doesn't mean certain players have to play. It doesn't mean certain coaches have to call certain plays. As long as they put on a football game, it could be fixed. They could be cheating. They could do whatever they want. You got what you paid for. The NFL is free and clear of any, you know, what it has to provide to you. As long as they don't play basketball or put on a boxing match instead of a football game, they've, you know, done what they told you they were going to do as a ticket purchaser so there's no fraud being conducted if their game's being fixed so mm-hmm. there's no law that's stopping them from doing this so the question is do you really believe they have enough integrity not to potentially alter the outcome of certain <laughs> games because that's what it's down to it's just their word that they're not it's not happening so that's obvious based on what you just said then it makes sense we think about the major sports and the events that happen in this country and it seems like the NFL and the NBA are the two that are really put on television, like at the optimal times. And I don't think that that's done just by coincidence. I mean, there has to be some kind of relationship between that ratings stream and those two sports in particular, because that's where I see personally, when I choose to watch these spectacles, that's when I see these um, very suspicious games and all the calls I mean, I think fans recognize, like, oh, that was a bad call. They threw a flag at an inconvenient time. But if you dig deeper, you really see that there's so much controversy. I think about the Sacramento Kings and the L.A. Lakers when they had the rivalry with Kobe versus um, Mike Bibby and just all the shenanigans with that. And oh, yeah. the NBA, I think Tim Donahue, he was one of the refs in question. Yeah. And – he, I watched the interview with him and Rashid Wallace and Bonzi Wells. Um, it was about a year ago or so, and he actually came onto their show, and he implicated um, Scott Foster, I think, and some of the current NF- NBA referees still in the league, and it's almost like they were just doing favors for the league. And it yeah. was common knowledge that no one did anything about it. Well, you remember there, there was an NBA ref named Dick Bavetta? Yeah, Bavetta, yeah. So I had a guy tell me that he uh, he knew Bavetta's I forgot what it was, it was his grandson or something like that, and basically they knew that Bavetta was called to officiate certain games when they wanted it to go the league's way. That basically that was his job. He was assigned certain specific games when the league wanted to push a game or NBA playoff series a certain way. He was one they called, and he did the league's bidding. And I mean, like I say, you've seen it. I mean, it just you know. 
I mean, I remember, again, I grew up around Chicago. Michael Jordan was still, you know, he's still hailed as like a conquering hero. And you watch and he got away with murder. And if anybody <laughs> touched him, you know, you got a foul. So all of a sudden, you know, just by officiating. And I mean, it just may be a few calls, but you create a bubble around a guy like Michael Jordan. And that's 20% of a team, right? I mean, there's only five guys really playing on the court. So you create a bubble around the best guy who's 20% of the team. And maybe instead of scoring 20 points a night, he's scoring 30 or 35 points a night. And guess what? His team's going to win more games because he's getting 15 more free points, essentially, just because of this bubble you've created. Now, if he scores 15 more points a game, and now the team's winning by 10 instead of losing by five, and they keep winning more and more games, guess what? They're going to go far. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it's basic math and it's basic, you know, ideology of how these games work. And so all it takes is just that little bit. You know, you just give a certain player a little bit more benefit of the calls, a little more room to operate, and he's going to do better. You look at, you know, Tom Brady. If his offensive line can get away with holding more often than it should have because the refs were told, hey, we got to protect Tom Brady, so don't throw the flag when his team's holding. Well, guess what? He's going to have more time to pass the ball. He's going to complete more passes. They're going to score more points. They're going to win more games. And that's all it takes. You know, it's one of those things where guys, you know, I got attacked by a guy on Twitter over anal you know he's all one of these analytics guys and he's like oh the analytics prove that games aren't fixed because it would show up i go dude show me the analytics where you can prove that a a penalty was supposed to be called but wasn't called so show me the analytics where non-calls exist in your analytics because you can't Mm -hmm. and so if again if a team gets away with 10 times of offensive holding when they should be flagged 10 times that's going to change the game if a player you know should be called for foul the nba and isn't called for foul the nba he's going to win more games. I mean, and you can't quantify that. So it doesn't show up in the statistics at all. So those are the little things. You just give guys a little more room to work, especially certain star players, and it changes the outcome of a game, and those teams are going to go further. Those stars are going to be propelled more. People are going to be more excited about those players going further. And it benefits everybody because, remember, all the, you know, a lot of the revenue is shared. The NFL shares like 80 to 85% of its revenue. So when one team does really well and one team does really bad, they're still split in the same pie almost equally. So nobody loses on the ownership side. Oh, that's a very good point you make. And since you brought that up about the shared revenue between the, NBA, the NFL teams, uh, does that apply to the Green Bay Packers too? Because oh, yeah. that, they're the only team that's publicly owned. Is that correct? Yeah, so they're the only one that actually has to put out a financial statement because they're a publicly owned team. Um, but yeah, okay. no, they share the same amount of revenue. I mean, and that's the big thing is, you know, the NFL is what it's gets something like $8 billion a year now, just from television rights. And you split that up amongst the 32 teams and they're making a ton of money just off of that. I mean, literally the television networks literally pay every NFL players, coaches, you know, trainers salary. I mean, the television networks, it just basically goes right from the television networks right into the players. And that's why too, also the, so many NBA players are paid so astronomically is because, because of the collective of bargaining agreement, the NBA basically has to split all money 50, 50 with the players. And there's only 12 guys on an NBA roster. So right. it winds up, they're splitting like, you know, $4 billion amongst the 450 players in the NBA. Well, that's mm-hmm. a lot of money. <laughs> and that's why these guys have, you know, 15, $20 million contracts. And then they play six minutes a night because they basically have to get that money because they have to give it to the players through their contracts. Very interesting. Um, You said something there about the NFL, about the shared revenue, which to me, so regardless of the outcomes, like they're making tons of money. So to me, that would incentivize having very close games. Do you notice the last few years, there have been so many overtime games in the NFL and just all these nail biters? And I think a lot of that goes into the the highlighted spotlight games, like Thursday night football. I think now Amazon exclusively has the yeah. rights to Thursday night football. And it creates these crazy situations because my brother, he gambles a, a lot more than I do. I really don't gamble anymore, but he casually gambles. And he would talk about um, – the spreads, like the totals, would be 42 points or something. And for the audience, just so you know, that is when both teams combine to score that amount of points. So if we're saying the final score is 24-17 in a football game and the over and under is 42, the net game will be an under because that's 41 points total. This happens so often. Do you think that that's just by coincidence 
that these games are always within a point or two of margin when we talk about these spreads? How is that even determined? Well, the, it's interesting because I actually dug into the kind of like the sports betting end of all of this. And uh, I mean, I talked to people in Las Vegas and I talked to some guys who used to work out in Las Vegas. And, you know, it's kind of because a lot of people do think that a lot of people say Vegas when they mean kind of like the gambling industry. They'll just say Vegas as if it's an entity, but it's, you know, it's spread across everywhere. Um, it's interesting because, you know, talking to those guys who actually work professionally in the sports books in Las Vegas, one guy especially who ran one of the biggest um, sports books, the Stardust, back in the 1970s and 80s. I mean, he said he'd never once talked to anybody from the NFL. And I mean, this guy was very open and honest with me how he did things and whatever. And he said he'd never heard from the league. So, you know, he kind of felt it was kind of a conspiracy theory of people <laughs> saying that, you know, Vegas and the NFL are tied together. And that's why games are so close from the point spread or the over under and that sort of thing. And maybe that's the way it was back then. Maybe it's different today. I don't know. But I think you're you're on to something with it's amazing how often primetime games, whether it's Thursday night, Sunday night, Monday night. They always don't lately, especially in the past, like you say, like five years or so have become like nail biting games, no matter who's playing. It's just like all of a sudden, you know, it's comes down to the final drive or the final two minutes or the final <laughs> even play of the game or overtime or whatever. And I mean, I don't I don't think that's a coincidence. Now, whether it's tied to the gambling end of it or not, I don't know. But I don't I think that's one of the things the NFL does. And I think that's one of the times you see certain flags come out and that sort of thing to kind of like you say, maybe not fix the game to say team a beats team b but just enough for even the referees to say hey we don't want this game to be a runaway because it's a prime time game we just want to keep it close you know the team that's supposed to win may still win but let's just throw a flag here or there to help the other team the underdog keep it close so people keep watching until the very end because that makes the networks happy makes the advertisers happy and then in the end that's going to make money back for the nfl and that's all it takes again just a couple of calls here or there just to push it a little bit, massage it a little bit, and keep things close. Because it's amazing how many times, you know, you've seen a game, especially this year, that was a runway blowout, and they had some amazing, crazy comebacks this year. I mean, a couple, <laughs> like, literally record-setting games where teams dominated in the first half, and then in the second half, it's like they've, you know, three plays punt, three plays punt, three plays punt, three plays punt. It's like, well, what happened? I mean, you were killing these guys. You are up, you know, 20 points, and all of a sudden, it changes. And I know sports... That can happen in sports, but again, does it happen that often in sports and that often amongst professionals where it's a runaway game and it doesn't stay a runaway game? Because I remember as a kid, there was plenty of games that were, you know, 35 to 10 or, you know, 42 to 7. I mean, there were blowouts back in the day, and now it seems like that's vanished. There were there have been so many oddities, and my parents, I've made them a lot more skeptical. My dad's already like that. He kind of connected the dots. I think ago. as you get older, that happens. <laughs> yeah. I think you become more cynical <laughs> and you start thinking about things. You're just like, wait a second. Mm -hmm. We were watching, I think it was last year, not this previous year, but last year, I think the Ravens were playing the Steelers and it was Ben Roethlisberger's last year. And there was so much around the Steelers that year when, when they got to the playoffs in his last year. The Ravens were playing, and I was telling my mom and dad, Watch them go for two. Like, they didn't even have to go for the two-point conversion, the Ravens. But they did it anyway, and they missed the two-point conversion. And I'm saying to myself, who in their right mind, if you're a coach, who would take a chance on going for two where conventional tells you you just you settle for the tie, you go into overtime. But for whatever reason, they kept going for two-point conversions. And I've seen these sort of weird calls the last few years. I think it was the, the Vegas – team was playing the Chargers last year and both teams had a chance to make the playoffs. Oh yeah. And yeah. the Steelers would have been eliminated if they would have tied. And the commentators kept saying, if they tie, the Steelers are going to be eliminated from the playoffs. And there was one instance before the half where the Chargers went for it on their own 24 yard line. And on a four down asset I said, it doesn't make any sense at all. Like why are they doing that kind of stuff? I see those kind of calls happen more and more now when I'm watching. No, I agree. And, and, you know, they like to chalk it all up to the analytics. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah. what it does, right? I mean, it's like, you know, the analytics say, if you do this, you'll win, you know, 80% of your games. And the thing that the analytics don't take into account for, which drives me nuts, is, well, it kind of depends who you're playing against, you know? I mean, if it says, well, you know, it's fourth and one, and the analytics say, if you go for it and you get a first down, you know, you're going to win 90% of your games. 
But the analytics don't say, well, is the defense you're playing like the 1985 Bears or the 7019 Steelers? Or is it, you know, you're playing some cream puff team? Because, <laughs> you know, it, it depends, you know, what your chances of making it, it, you know, you can stretch it out across, you know, all time and say, well, you know, 80% of the time this happens, but it depends who you're playing against. And what's happened, you know, the fatal thing about stats is like, you know, if a baseball player hits 300, it says, well, three out of 10 times you should get a hit. And now he's 0 for 8, so therefore he should get a hit the next time up. Well, guess what? That doesn't matter. What happened in the past doesn't matter. It matters what happens right in this instance, and the guy strikes out again. But that's the same with the thing with the analytics and football. It depends who you're playing against. It really depends on the situation. I don't care about your stats and your numbers saying that, because how many times have you seen, well, you know, according to our, you know, stats, their win probability was 99.8%. Yeah, they lost. So what does your win probability stat mean? Well, nothing. It means absolutely nothing because, again, that's going off what happened in the past, not at this specific instance. And so that's the thing. And then you see, like you say, these really crazy, stupid calls that coaches make. And you at home watching on your couch, you're like, why are you doing this? This defies convention. Well, they just chalk it up to analytics. And like I say, maybe that's a way of hiding how they're doing things. Maybe some of it is coaching. Maybe some of it is coaching calls. And now they're coaching it or couching it, I should say, based through these analytics. So you went home, go, oh, well, yeah, that made sense because that's what the analytics said when in your football brain, because you watch enough football games, says, well, that is just the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, we talked a little bit before we mentioned the analytics portion. We talked some about these um, games. And it's so sad having kids because, um, my daughter, she's more into WWE, and my son likes. Well, at least WWE. it's honest. It's yeah, honest exactly sports entertainment. Honest I mean, that's it. what it is. Yeah. But my son, he's he's big into NFL and NBA, and it's so hard because he's kind of caught up because he's heard me um, say things to friends and family about just like I don't want to watch this or whatever. It looks so fake and stuff, and then he's starting to pick up on that language, but. It's sad. He was watching the NBA game last night. I wrote it down. It was the Lakers and the Grizzlies. And I looked at the final score, and I didn't even have to know what happened in the game to know that it was within one or two points of the margin of error when it came to the total. The total was 230 and a half, and the total last night ended up being 230 points. <laughs> it, it's almost it's – so, it's such a joke. And it's always one of the feature games. It's almost like they let some games are like blowouts and it's like it has nothing to do with the spread. But then those games like that are so tight. Even though it was a blowout, it was still within a point of the margin of error when you talk about yeah, the top players. Spread. Like, how is that even possible for them to get it that right every time or that consistently? Yeah, well, consistently. yeah, I mean, the guys who are supposedly like the bookmakers making those numbers – supposedly you know again they have no supposedly no connection <laughs> to the leagues or whatever and they can just do it through you know their own brains and their computer programs or whatever and maybe they can i don't know but i mean you do touch on a point too where you know just even though because we're talking about these games being fixed and manipulated and what have you i i don't think the nfl the nba is scripted like professional wrestling i mean okay. legally speaking I, they're the same I mean, legally speaking, professional wrestling in the NFL, there's no real difference from them whatsoever. It's just like I said, professional wrestling is honest because they're forthright with the fact saying that this is scripted entertainment, but it's still athletic. It's still there. These guys are bigger. These women are bigger, stronger. They can do amazing things in the ring that a lot of other people can't do. Same goes for the NFL, NBA, NHL players. They can do things a lot of people can't do. But I don't think like the NFL sits at the beginning of the year and says, okay, this year the Chiefs are going to win the Super Bowl. I don't think they do that. I think what happens is, again, in certain games like we are talking about earlier with primetime games, yeah, maybe they manipulate massage games to keep them interesting longer, but they're not necessarily dictating who wins or loses. I think that happens maybe just a few times over the course of a season where they do need to push a certain team or they want to push a certain athlete a little bit further. And I think as storylines develop within a season, then they also, again, will kind of, go along with it and say, okay, you know, everybody's picking up on this. Everybody's picking up that. About this. Well, let's see if we can push that into the playoffs or let's see if we can make this, you know, four, seven game playoff series, go to six games or seven games, as opposed to just four games and being a blowout. 
because it generates more interest, more revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think it's something that happens in each and every game. And it may happen way off less than I think. But again, if it only happens once or twice, even over the course of five years, well, your integrity's out the window if you're a league. You know, if you told the referees, hey, look, we want the Lakers to beat the Kings in 2002 because it's going to make for a more exciting NBA Finals, well, that destroyed the league's credibility from that point forward. Mm-hmm. You know, if the NFL just fixed Super Bowl three, basically to make the merger between the AFL and the NFL seem more legitimate, well, that destroyed their integrity moving forward. You know, it's like having a spouse that cheats on you. They mm-hmm. just cheat on you once. Well, every time they go out, you got to be like, where are you going? <laughs> you know, and that's all it takes in the NFL. They fixed one game. Every other game, you got to be like, oh, wait a second. Now, that was kind of an odd outcome. You, you sure you didn't, you know, manipulate that? That's, that's all it is. It's just that little bit. And like I say, if I can prove, and I think I can prove, that all the dominoes are lined up for them to fix these games and do it legally and have no recourse for, you know, no problem. If they do do it, what's to prevent them from tipping it over. That's all it takes is one domino, the whole line falls and now you got to fix the game. Okay. And I concluding 15 minutes, I want to talk a little bit about um, the scandal that happened at Arizona state with the, the point shaving scandal with headache Smith. And, um, I think there's a big documentary series called Bad Sport on Netflix where people can, can see this. It doesn't just talk about that. It talks about cricket fixing. You mentioned in your book of, about horse racing as well. You talked about Muhammad Ali and Sphinx and um, Liston and, and just all the classic matches with Muhammad Ali and just how that was part of the entertainment realm as well. I mean, you talk a lot about that. But I want to conclude kind of going back to the student athlete function and the NCAA, I want to kind of conclude with that. But before we do that, I want to get your views on um, point fixing in college basketball specifically, because the way they paint these things, it's like, obviously that happened in the nineties, I think with headache Smith, but they almost make it seem like that that couldn't be a possibility these days because that happened back then in the nineties. Do you think that that's a very big possibility now with the revenue, especially being fueled by the college basketball tournament, the NCAA tournament, that that could be a possibility as well with the point fixing in college basketball? Oh, I'm certain it's going on. I'm certain without a doubt it's happening. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't, I, I, the only reason they can deny it's happening is because nobody's getting caught and arrested for it. <laughs> I mean, that's mm-hmm. exactly the same thing with the NFL saying, you know, we've never had a game fix in our history. Yeah. Well, that's just because no one's ever been arrested and convicted of doing it, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. I mean, with the NCAA for basketball, for example, I mean, I honestly think with the amount of money I have in my bank account, and it's not much, I could fix a college basketball game because I mean, in many cases, these guys aren't getting paid. You know, I mean, they, I know they have that name image and licensing or name, name image and likeness agreement now where they can profit off their own, you know, name and actually make money on the side. But that's not every athlete. That's not everybody's getting paid to do that. Mm. And, you know, it's very easy. You know, a lot of people think what it is, is like if you're going to shave points in the game, you're going to take the team that's supposed to win, like if they're supposed to win by 10, you know, the margin or like point spreads 10 points and you pay somebody off. So they only win by like seven or eight, you know, so they still win the game and it's, you know, but it's just not by the point spread. Well, I would do it the opposite way. I would take the team that's supposed to lose and I would make sure they lose by even more. So if the point spreads 10, I would pay off the losing team and make them lose by 12 or 15 or 20 because they're already supposed to lose anyway. In everybody's mind, they're supposed to lose. So what's the difference if you lose by two or if you lose by 20? Well, it makes me money if you lose by 20. It doesn't do you any good if you lose by two. So just underperform. You're already expected to lose. Pay off the losing team. I mean, it's a lot easier to do. And it's race is a lot less suspect. But the fact is, the NCAA, since I think for like 20, 25 years now, every four years, they have this uh, survey, anonymous survey of all their student athletes. It's like 19,000 student athletes. And they ask them a whole series of questions, all from all different aspects of sports, you know, everything from just all sorts of things. But one of the things they do ask, and they ask every year, every four years when they do this, I should say, they ask them, have you ever been approached to fix a game? Have you ever known somebody who's fixed a game or have you yourself ever participated in point shaving or game fixing? And every time they've done this, 
like one to two percent of the respondents say that they've either been approached to know somebody or haven't themselves fixed the game. So if they're being honest, and let's assume they're being honest and not just joking around and saying, yeah, I have. But if they're being honest, that means like literally hundreds of games in the NCAA, be it basketball or football, are being fixed every year. And wow. nobody's doing anything about it because you know how many people the NCAA has looking into gambling violations in the United States right now? They have one guy. Oh, one seriously? guy. <laughs> He's they have one guy who literally does gambling compliance for the entire NCAA. And you're surprised nobody finds out about this stuff. I mean, you know, again, CBS, even ESPN, they all invest in college basketball and college football, all these major networks, and they invest billions of dollars into it. Well, the same as with the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, the rest. If they invest all this money into these sports, do you really think they're going to do investigative reporting into them? <laughs> Are they really going to dig into them and try to find, you know, corruption with any of these sports no because it's going to affect their billion dollar investments they're just going to be shooting themselves in the foot so mm-hmm. nobody's out there looking for this stuff but like he's mentioned if you look around the world if you go globally you can prove without a doubt soccer matches cricket matches rugby matches badminton matches i mean boxing matches horse racing i mean you can see the games are fixed all over the world yet suppose the united states this never happens <laughs> and, I mean, and that's just it you know find me a crime that happens worldwide but doesn't take place in the united states and that one apparently is game fixing or point shaving it doesn't happen here that's a really good point you make um i, I want to leave with two questions the one question i have is i don't know if you followed the dan snyder situation in, in the nfl a little bit i was wondering what does he have on the league for them to basically <laughs> I mean, and we're talking about the commanders. Like, I don't know if he's the owner anymore. He's not, right? No, I think he still is at the moment. He still is the owner. Okay. So we're talking about the current Washington commanders owner, Dan Snyder. I think he owns other stuff too. The Cavaliers? Oh, that I'm not sure of. But I think he has ties to like all these other like um, companies and stuff too. But I wonder what he has on Roger Goodell to, for them to basically almost kill that story. And and I bring this up because there are lots of channels popping up these last three years. There have been all types of channels popping up about sports fixing. Uh, some of, They're not in your angle, though. They're more so like they do the numerology stuff, the gematria, all that stuff. And you have, Yeah, I don't get that stuff. Right. And they have huge <laughs> channels and stuff on that. Like some of the stuff they talk about the storylines, like I, that makes a little bit more sense when you talk about the storylines. But when you start connecting that to numbers and all this other stuff... I, I kind of get lost. For me, that's just another form of entertainment. Like, I would watch it because it's entertaining, but not because I'm like, oh, gosh, you're onto something. Well, it always seems like they're cherry-picking which numbers they use and how they add them or subtract them or multiply them to get whatever. <laughs> you know, it's just like funky math. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, 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 that part of it, I don't, I don't get it all. But with Snyder, I mean, I think people forget that, like, any league, whether it's the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, whatever – the owners is like a little special club and they only let in certain people, you know, you can't just be like, well, I'm going to sell my team and some guy comes in and says, Hey, I'll buy that. And they go, okay, they make the deal. No, it's like, it has to be approved by the league. All the other owners have to agree upon the guy. They're kind of letting in to be one of the new members of their little ownership club. And so, like you say, with Dan Snyder and all the corruption that apparently is going on with the commanders, he's in the club. And so Roger Goodell, you know, a lot of people think it's Roger Goodell, then the owners. No, the owners are on top. Then it's Roger Goodell. They hired him basically to be their little spokesman and do what they do their bidding and be the bad guy. I mean, he's basically like, you know, Vince McMahon in the professional wrestling. There you go. They all boo Roger Goodell, but, you know, he doesn't care because he's making the money. Same with, you know, Vince McMahon. It's He was making the money. Boo me all you want. I'm making millions. Same with Roger Goodell. He gets paid $10 million a year to go out there and get booed, but he's doing it at the owner's <laughs> behest because they're in control. And so you have one of these guys now amongst this little cabal of 30 guys who's got a problem. And like, say, I'm sure he has dirt on the other guys. I'm sure he does. And so that's why they can't just be like, Hey, you're out. It has to be kind of a process and it has to be a slow process that kind of pushes him aside. And he kind of has to agree to be pushed aside because of this. And that goes back to who was it? Donald Sterling in the NBA, the Clippers owner who got ousted because of his racist comments. 
and he probably should have been ousted. But again, it's not like they could just be like, you're out. It kind of has to be a process. It can't just be a thing because he's now he's in the club. He's in the inner circle and you can't just get kicked out of the inner circle like that. Mm-hmm. I, I thought it was interesting how the league covered for Robert Kraft big time because apparently he was involved in some, um, a sex ring in Florida. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Closed that they closed that down quick. They shut that dialogue down quick because oh my gosh, he's the he's part of the Patriots. Yeah. <laughs> and well, they and it's, let and that it's golden a... boy like Tom Brady, the golden boy, and his owner. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's the thing too is you forget like I mentioned, you know, that story got shut down, but it's also because again, ESPN, CBS, NBC, they're all invested in the NFL. So are they going to really, again, dig into that and expose more that didn't come out because of law enforcement? No, they're going to try to make it go away just as fast because they're all in bed together. And that's the thing. You don't see these stories break normally because ESPN did an investigative report. We've uncovered this. It's always, well, you know, this guy got arrested. Well, now we have to go cover it because it's news. It's not because we uncovered it. It's because some other law enforcement thing happened or some lawsuit came out. And now we got to go chase the story, but they didn't create the story. It's always kind of, you know, retroactive that they get involved. And so that's the thing. And then they can, like you say, shut it down pretty quick because then they can be like, oh, we just lost interest in it or whatever. It's probably (laughs) because the league says, you know what, we need this to go away. And they go, okay, we'll make it go away. Final question. Um, I know you did it. I found out about you through the Dan Patrick interview on his show. And I think this was back in 2000. 2014, maybe? That was a while ago. Yeah, it's a long time, right? And did you get invited back onto his show after that? Nope. Because I I watched another interview with you, and you basically said that, how did he, how did you get that interview, first of all? And do you feel like he was skeptical of you during the interview? Well, I thought it was, I think I got the interview because back then I was writing for a place called Sports on Earth. And I wrote this article basically arguing that sports gambling should be legalized. Mm -hmm. And it's still a thing I agree with. I mean, obviously it creates, you know, some other issues, societal issues with addicted gambling and young kids gambling and that sort of thing. And just to kind of change the sports world in general. But I still think, at least in my opinion, like a lot of things like marijuana should be legalized. Sports gambling should be legalized. People should be able to make their own decisions. If they're adults, they should be able to do what they want to do. If it's not hurting anybody, Mm -hmm. feel free to do it. So, they brought me on, I think, to talk about sports gambling. And what happened was um, basically in the very beginning of that interview, I managed to um, turn the table somehow and got Dan Patrick to bite on the game fixing thing. And when he did that, I just ran with it and he kind of got stuck running with it too. But I, I think I brought up things that he never thought about or never crossed his mind before. And that was the fact that, you know, like, like we talked about earlier, that games – all over the world are being fixed and people are being arrested and going to jail for fixing games, soccer matches, rugby matches, cricket matches, what have you. And same thing here in the United States, we act like we never heard of such a thing. Like it's impossible. (laughs) And so I think I kind of, I think I caught him off guard more than anything. And that's why this kind of, he was just kind of like, Whoa. (laughs) Yeah. I I noticed that I could tell by his body language that something was up. Yeah. It made him seemingly like uncomfortable. And, but it, he ran with it and I was like, well, this is what I know. So this is what I'm going to tell you. And it's again, you know, the thing is I get called a sports conspiracy theorist, but I don't, I'm not making anything up. Mm-mm. And that's the thing. I'm just connecting the dots. And like I said, can I prove that game X has been fixed because of television? No, but I think if Tom Brady came out tomorrow and said, guess what? You know, half my, half my career was like made up. It was make-believe. You know, the NFL let me win these Super Bowls because I did them little favors here or there. Peyton Manning said the same thing. People be like, well, where's your proof? How do you prove that, Tom? You know (laughs) what I mean? How do you prove that, Peyton? How do you prove that you were fixing these games? Because we don't believe you. And everybody's going to attack them. Whoever would come out and say, hey, I fixed games for the league's behest would be attacked because they would have to prove it. And their only proof would literally be, well, watch how he played in this game. Well, maybe he just had a bad game. Maybe he just had an off day. You know, maybe the referee didn't call that penalty intentionally. Maybe it was a legit penalty. And that's the thing is it's hard to say whether somebody underperformed on purpose or somebody just underperformed, whether a referee made a bad call just because in that split second, he, he thought it was holding and it really wasn't, but it was a bad call, but that's the way he 
the, you know, the cookie crumbled. And that's the problem. And that's a problem that even the FBI had when it was investigating games being fixed back in the 60s and 70s that many times they would have information ahead of time that said this guy was working with this gambler to fix this game. And the result would be exactly as they had kind of predicted ahead of time, but they couldn't prove that that player underperformed. So, you know, what are you supposed to do? You can't arrest a guy just because he had a bad game. And it's the <laughs> same thing. You know, you, you can't say for fact that the game was fixed because somebody had a bad game or made a bad call. But, again, you connect all the dots and things start to add up at the end. Yeah, I believe people are starting to wake up. <clears throat> just, um, I'll go on Twitter after some of these big games, and I'll just type in the league itself, and you click on the comment section there. And people automatically go to that, like, oh, guys, this stuff is not real. Like, they're, yeah. they're breaking these games. And and this is just, like, all all types of people are saying this stuff. I think people are starting to wake up and realize that it is more of just, like, an entertainment spectacle. Well, and it is. More than anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. So mm-hmm. they should wake up to it. And like you say, I don't try to tell people not to watch. Right. I just try to tell people to watch in a certain way or at least understand what it is you're consuming. Because, like I say, we all need escapes. Mm-hmm. Whether, like I say, movies, television, comic books, whatever, you know, you need an escape. And if it's football, fine. If it's basketball, fine. But just understand what it is you're watching is a multi billion dollar business that's out to make money. They don't put these games on for free. May not cost you anything <laughs> no, to watch not. them on television, but they're not playing them for free. They're there to make money. And so you just have to be an alert consumer as to what you're watching. Brian, I really enjoyed this interview. And I tell you, how would you? How would the person reach out to you if they had a question or a comment for you? What would be the easiest way to contact you? The best place is through my website, which is thefixesin.net. And they can buy my books there. They can email me. And I always respond to whoever emails me. might be slow, but I get back to you sooner or later. <laughs> I, I totally appreciate that. Yes, check out his site, thefixesin.net. It's a very elaborate site. has a lot of cool stuff on there. Support him. He has um, plenty of books on there. Um, he's written for Sports Illustrated. He's written for the Bleacher Report. So um, check out all of his content. And again, Brian, I appreciate you accepting that invitation. Oh, no problem. Uh, Thanks for having me on. Beautiful people. Have a great evening. And we will talk to you next week with Jack Rasmus. We're going to talk about the Ukraine-Russia uh, situation. Um, he published a, a chapter in a book called Flashpoint in Ukraine, how the U.S. drives uh, World War III. And um, the two other authors that are going to come on, too, aside from Jack Rasmus, to talk about that uh, situation that's going on right now. We have a lot of guests lying down the road, professors, um, politicians, activists, just all the nine yards. But again, have a great day, and we'll talk soon. Cheers.